publishing houses here who have been getting increasingly vocal. Yeah, I think the only redress we have at this point, since the, the tech companies are not particularly willing to, to engage with meaningful discussions about it, is to go down the legal route, which unfortunately will take time and be even more expensive. Um, already there's been a case in California where the judges, the, the courts have gone through the different headers of, of the case and they've dismissed some elements of it, but they've gone forward with the idea that uh, our copyrighted works should be should not be sort of plundered in this way. So we'll see how that goes, but and we'll also see how uh, the publishers have uh, worked for us in this particular way. I mean, it's in all our interest to protect the quality of the written word and to protect the quality of the imagination, which is ultimately what this is about. Um, you know, my, my work is the product of, of years of practice, but it's also the product of my imagination. That I have come up with stories that nobody else has come up with in quite this way. Uh, and I don't see why that should be uh, available to be ripped off in this way. Is it too late? I don't know. I hope it isn't too late, because I, th I think if we go down this road, what we will ultimately see is the impoverishment of the culture. Uh, it will sideline authors who are effectively no longer needed, uh, and uh, thus, ultimately, we end up with a much poorer culture, we end up with a much poorer set of imaginative options. Uh, I think if you put ideas, broad ideas, into AI models, what you get are poor replicas at the moment, and that will improve, obviously, as, as the machines learn better from everyone else's work. But I would like to think that the human element will be missing. Except, isn't this the direction we're headed? It's, for example, <laughs> if they were prepared to pay you, wouldn't that solve your particular issue? Well, it would solve it on the surface, in that at least authors would be being recompensed for the work. Um, the route we're going down with AI model is the idea that uh, you no longer have to pay authors to produce something in the first place. You just rip off everything that's been done before, uh, feed it through the computer, put a different name into it, uh, a different style into it, you know, say something, write something in, in the style of Val McDermott and Ali Smith, uh, and you get something different. How serious a moment do you think this is for uh, writers? I think it's a very serious moment. If you create a culture where it's no longer economically viable for people to be writers, why would they write? Are we really at that point? I, I don't want to be a sort of doomsayer, but the bottom line is, if you're not being paid for what you do, then you're doing it in the interstices of what you are doing in order to make a living. And so you don't have the kind of focus, the kind of practice, the kind of day-to-day -day learning your craft that good writers aspire to. Well, but, uh, when we contacted OpenAI, Google DeepMind and Meta for a response. And, uh, that's it from us, PMs at five. I'm Sarah Montague, and that's The World at 1.45. Studio direction was by Annie Smith. The editor was Sophie Borkham. Now on Radio 4, our series marking 40 years since the miners' strike, Strike Boy, with Mark Watson. So we're probably, what, maybe 50 yards from the house, on the way up to the colliery. I just remember a commotion one day. It was warm, and it was in the evening. And I just remember someone saying there's like a TV crew on the road and so came out of the house and just looked up the road and, and there was a big crowd of people hanging around. So kind of I walked up and some people said that the BBC were here to do something. In mining communities around Nottingham, the strike is creating a bitterness it's hard for the outsider to appreciate. Next door neighbours, for years close friends and often workmates, now find themselves on it was exciting, you know, the, the, the BBC were 50 yards from my house. And then I just remember uh, getting close, was a I was only maybe 10, 10 or so yards away from the guy behind the microphone and then the police found was behind, behind the camera. And then I remember, <laughs> I remember being, being, being hit by a policeman. It was just a glove across the face. At the time it was just something that happened. I'm Mark Watson, I'm the son of a strike in Nottinghamshire Minor and I was... 11 years old when my little mining village was full of police 40 years ago because of the strike. Ever since I was a kid caught up in the excitement of it all, I've, I've wanted to find out what really happened back then. I'm not a journalist or a podcaster, 
but the series is just me, a Nottinghamshire miner's son, trying with an open mind to make sense of what happened to my community and to the country. From BBC Radio 4, this is Strike Boy. Episode 6, Policing the Pickets. There was a lot of uh, mistrust of the police back then, rightly or wrongly. But also, my mum tells me that one day uh, a policeman gave me an apple and orange. <laughs> we didn't have much, you know, we didn't have much food. You know, the times went up and down on this road here. There were hundreds of police at various points, um, as well as there were hundreds of pickets. Probably none of them, none of them, any of them came from anywhere near. <laughs> It was just a very, you know, I came back, it was just a very odd time to be in the centre of a world. We're in uh, West Yorkshire. We've come to see a policeman who was, uh, a policeman in the strike and a dispute. It's be interesting to sort of understand his view of the strike. Hiya. Have we found the right house? Yeah. Simon. <laughs> Simon. Good to meet you. Nice to meet you, Mark. Thank you very much. This is just giving me a bit of credibility is this, before we start. That's me getting my long service award from Lord Lieutenant of it's Dusty, isn't it? Oh. And that's my certificate of loyal service. And it says on there, Conduct assessment exemplary. And everybody who read that says, how the hell have you got that, Maps? I said, well, you just a little bit clever and you don't get caught. I am Alan Lappelbeck and I was a serving West Yorkshire police officer during the miners' strike. So how long have you, uh, so you got, this is long service? Oh, 26 years. I, I did 27 and a half. How long in the strike do you think you spent in that time? A lot. Uh, certainly half of it. We were obviously, we had our own force to police, but we formed mutual aid which was PSU's Police Support Unit, which was a driver, which was me, because I'd longer service in, and I was a transit train driver. I had an inspector and a sergeant in front of me and ten cops in the back. When we were moving in convoy, which was it quite a lot, I was like driving the first black Maria behind the superintendent and a traffic cop driving it in the Range Rover. So we were like, first at every job sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Which was well, exciting, but sometimes a bit... <laughs> Oh shit, <laughs> a lot of time you were sat on your backside in sunshine in summer, but you couldn't take your boots off. So what you did was, you all had shorts on underneath, or oh, boxer shorts, and we just laid up gas, trousers down there like that, sat in sun, playing cards or smoking, with just a vest on, for a couple of hours, and then it went, right, get dressed lads, you're back on entrance, you know. But you couldn't take your boots off in case there were a shout. What kind of information did you used to get about where pickets would be, or or where there's going to be a major flashpoint or... Well, we didn't know initially, but eventually we were always sent somewhere and obviously the information were coming in, intelligence were coming in from somewhere, obviously. I didn't hear from a, a good source that they had a phone tapped in the uh, engine headquarters. So we knew and we were usually there before. Did you generally get on OK with the miners? Yeah, on the yeah, fine. Lines? Well, we, what we said to them was, look, we're not here to fall out. We're doing what we're told, and you know, you'd have pie chips and peas from all our canteen, sometimes you'd had it twice, and then you got a packed meal with crisps and water in and a pork pie. Pork pies. Because, oh, well, they've got kids and stuff like that, and we were getting fatter and getting paid all this overtime, and actually, we felt sorry for them. We did a lot of riot training. In no. anticipation for the strike? No, just generally, because we'd have the 81 riots in Chapel Town in Leeds. Toxteth and Moss Side, and I went to Toxteth and Moss Side. So we, we were trained up for it. So that's why we were like sort of the first force to go. Was it a big kind of mining area? In West Yorkshire, we didn't have as many as South Yorkshire, but we did have quite a few. We had Emily, it's just up there where it masters. And that in winter was the coldest place I have ever been. It's cold at this part of the world anyway. It is, it? yeah. I remember we, we built this little like a dugout out of pallets because you had to watch through infrared glasses for two hours on and then you were two hours in a port again and we're all on sleeping or playing cards. And me and my mate were just looking and he had a look through and up with us and said, 
Let's have a look at this match. There must be a lot of headlights coming over. It's only half past two in the morning. Headlights, more headlights, more headlights coming from the barns the area. I thought, shit, this is a big picky. And we were like a cork in a bottle at the top of this lane. There were thousands of them and about 400 of us. And then they started throwing potatoes at us out of this field. And then we realised potatoes had six inch nails in them. So we then had to get policemen's helmets off, NATO helmets on and visors down. And I ended up stuck. And my feet were off floor for a, a few minutes. And I ended up with hyperventilation. So they pulled me out and uh, took me into the pit area. And there were a miner who had pneumoconiosis they used to get miners. It was the chest. Yeah. And I was in an ambulance with him and there were five ambulances going to Pinderfields and they thought he were dying and I was in an ambulance with him. So the motorcycle escorted us a little more Friday in the hotels. We went crazy. Anyway, he survived. How did you feel when you were sort of when you were getting the potatoes lobbed out you were oh, I wasn't that happy. I mean they threw bottles and stuff and bricks at us. When you were working 12 hours a day up in uh, West Yorkshire or South Yorkshire, you were working 12 hours a day plus an hour either then travelling to get to where you were going. So you were working 14, sometimes 15 hours a day. And if it were your day off, you were on time and a half. And if it were a bank holiday, 15 hours at double time. That wasn't bad. And that's why there's a lot of Scargill suites and stuff like that in people's houses. Because I'll end up getting some money out. What's a Scargill Suite? An extension called the Scargill Suite. Well, like a big conservatory. It's a regular thing. So they called the cop Scargill Suite because... Because it was built on overtime. Because it was built on overtime. Good to see of Margaret Thatcher and Arthur Scargill. I mean, that's not just, I guess, typical for West Yorkshire. There were forces from the rest of the country coming in. Oh, right. Well, the Met came in the little green buses and they were just a joke. And they got out at round. I was scratching my backside and yawning and lighting a fag. They were just shallow and rubbish. Like the Met Burnet 20 pound notes. You, you've heard that, haven't you? I've not heard that. Stood in Levi's with their little green buses and went pickets and going past it cars, waving a 20 pound note and setting fire to it. What do you think about that? R ridiculous. Job were hard enough, was it? Well, at most of the time it were jocular with miners, but Augury have got a bit naughty. Coke works, what? A level of violence not seen on British streets in any recent industrial dispute. Orgreave were a bit different when the big push came at Orgreave. They were uh, bought a cabin which had wheels on, set fire and pushed down the hill. Then ramming shields with a telegraph pole. I did get hit with a brick and got uh, knocked over. It hit me on the shoulder. How did you feel at Orgreave? Orgreave, when the, when the corking wagons were going out and there was a big push from then, it was a bit frightening. And then some of Bobby's had, well you've seen it up the telly, had break ranks and were told not to. And then they're running all over and eating each other and kicking each other. There's no way I were doing that. Are these guys panicking or are they just, are they aggressive? I think they were merely panicking. But some of them were just red mist. You know, they'd, they'd lost it. You've been stood behind that shield for God knows how many hours. Can you do a, know of any sort of examples of, or heard of anything where it just looks kind of summary justice been... been oh, like... yeah. There were a lot of people hit with a truncheon and not arrested. But there again, there were a lot of cops kicked in the ghoulies and a couple of cops who ended up on the ground at Orgreave, as you may see in Octelly, got to kick him when they were on ground. And we had to go fetch him back, you know, because I were part of a little three-man or four-man snatch squad which went out like in a shape like that with the short shield just to bring somebody in who were injured or in a prisoner. There's some people that sort of said that the uh, army were involved with the police during the strike. Do you, can you well, remember that? I've been stood next to some lads who didn't sort of act like cops, and I'm pretty sure, because they just act like overalls on blue overalls. Not green or army overalls, but blue overalls, which we all had flameproof overalls. Uh, just where they acted, you know, I thought they, they must be army. Unless there were spotters. Could have been police spotters. Because everybody were watching for us getting into trouble as well by overreacting. Do you ever think at, at the time that you were politicised in a way? So you became, you just became, moved from sort of law enforcers to being given more powers? No, I think we were used, you know, publicly by being moved en masse. And I think government wanted us to be there in big numbers so that everybody saw it and that she wasn't giving in. 
So I suppose that was one of Marek Thatcher's handmaidens. But we just had to do as we were told. What did you think what he had to say? A lot of it was quite difficult to listen to, to be honest. Again, it was just a job for him. Obviously with lots of benefits, but also lots of danger attached to it. The, the money on strike on one side and not getting paid and struggling to feed the families. And the police on the other side fed at regular intervals and then in lots of money to pay for extension on the houses but you know also giving food to the miners as well they're good and bad on all sides you know I think it's a human a human dispute as well as a industrial dispute I think it sort of does bring out the best and, and worst in people Still 40 years on it, it's difficult to to hear it. And that's from me who was technically a bystander really in it. But I had heard rumours about the NUM headquarters being tapped, so I wasn't really surprised to hear Alan talk about that, I guess. Looking back for me, what's more shocking to me is that my dad was convinced our phone was tapped. I guess as a kid didn't really seem to bother me. It sort of felt normal in a way. But, you know, if I found out my phone was being tapped now, I'd really be worried. Next time on Strike Boy, the Battle of Orgreave from the other side. He fetched it down up, lads, top of his head. He went, whack. And all I remember seeing this young lad putting his hands up top of his head, blood spurred out all over, and then collapsed like a stone to the ground. Strike Boy was presented by Mark Watson and produced by Simon Mabin. And tonight Radio 4 revisits the story of the arson attacks on holiday homes and estate agents in Wales in the 1980s. Who were the terrorists Maibu and Glyndwr, the sons of Glyndwr, and how did they escape arrest and conviction? Home Fires tells their story at 8 o'clock. Radio 4's journey from fertilisation to first birthday continues. There was a woman and now there's an entire new human who's arrived into the world through her body. It's just mind-blowing. I'm exploring how science, society and history have shaped our approaches to childbirth. I know women will put their body through anything for the best of the baby, but that doesn't mean that they have to. Child, with me, India Rakata. I got the nurse to show me the placenta and then I took a photo, because I just think it's just such an amazing thing. Continues next Monday to Friday afternoon at 1.45 on Radio 4 and BBC Sounds. BBC News at two o'clock. The former Conservative Party Vice Chairman Lee Anderson has defected to Reform UK. He's the party's first MP since it was founded by Nigel Farage in 2018. Mr Anderson lost the Tory whip last month after he said Islamists had taken control of the London Mayor Sadiq Khan and refused to apologise. The Home Secretary James Cleverley was asked about his former colleague today. It wasn't that long ago where Lee Anderson said that a vote for reform is only going to let the Labour Party in, and I very much agree with that uh, assessment. I like him personally. I think he's made a real mistake. The Princess of Wales has apologised for a photo that Kensington Palace released on Mother's Day of her and her children. Several major news agencies withdrew the picture because of concerns it had been manipulated. In a statement, Kate said, like many amateur photographers, she occasionally experimented with editing. It was the first picture of her to be released since her abdominal surgery in January. Israel has continued its offensive in Gaza on the first day of the Islamic holy month of Ramadan. The Hamas-controlled health ministry says 16 people were killed and many wounded in an airstrike in Gaza City. Israel says it has killed 15 militants in central Gaza. The former Welsh health minister says he's embarrassed that most of his WhatsApp messages from the pandemic have been deleted. 
giving evidence to the COVID inquiry in Cardiff, Bourne Gething said he had tried to recover the information and insisted the app was not used for making government decisions. Nottinghamshire Police has been put under special measures and told to urgently produce an improvement plan. His Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary and Fire and Rescue Services took the decision after an inspection in January. Forces Chief Constable Kate Menel said she recognised the serious nature of the findings. Oppenheimer has emerged as the big winner at the Oscars. It won seven awards, including Best Picture, Best Actor for Cillian Murphy and Best Director for Christopher Nolan. BBC News. This is BBC Radio 4. Round Britain Quiz is back for a new series in an hour's time. In the first match, Wales play the south of England. Kirsty Lang is in the chair at three o'clock. First, though, Tony is busy with some Mother's Day DIY in the Archers. <laughs> A couple of inches, would you, George, in line with the top of the window. Is that better? Yeah, yes, that's it. Now, make a pencil mark where the screws need to go. There and there. OK, great. Now, carefully pass me down the hive. There you go. That's it. Uh, Where's the other one going? I think Natasha says she wants it over by the counter. Oh, they're going to look great. Are they actually from the Bridge Farm Angus's? Well, no, these ones are bigger than an Angus hide, but I went for the best colour match rather than size. I didn't think they'd be so soft and glossy. How are you going to stop people from stroking them? Well, I think we should encourage it. The colour, the warmth, the... Well, what would she say? The, the whole tactile charm of having hides on the wall. It's part of their attraction. Back to nature and all that? Yeah, back to a relationship between food and farming that gets lost. What with great long supply chains and supermarkets. We're saying that here at Bridge Farm Tea, we don't need to conceal the fact that meat comes from an animal. And to respect that animal, we should be using every bit of it. Except these hides are from Brookhouse. Uh, no, but they could be. Tony! What's up, fella? Never be all right. I thought you said you'd be finished by now. Our first Mothering Sunday bookings will start turning up soon. I don't want the sound of drilling while we serve seminal cake to frazzled mothers. No, of course not. Sorry. We'll, we'll get this one up quickly and pop back on Tuesday to do the one over by the counter. By the counter? Well, I thought we'd agreed you'd keep them to the seating area, not hanging over the food. Just following Natasha's instructions. Have a word with her if you like. Um, no, it's fine, whatever she says. I think they're going to look marvellous. I'm worried they'll make the room darker. What do you think, George? Um, I mean, they're nice, but also, uh, yeah, I agree with you there, Fallon. They are quite dark. This teacup is beautiful. It's lovely to drink out of. It was between that and a ceramic Wellington boot with a face. Odd choice. I took Martha to that vintage charity shop in Felpsham to pick something out for you. Ah. That cup and the weird boot man were the two things that caught her eye. <laughs> well, maybe we can get you the boot man for Father's Day. Yeah. Chris, is everything all right? Yeah, of course. Anyway, we'll get off now. Let you get ready for your afternoon tea with Kate. Oh, that's if you can persuade Martha to abandon her game. I mean, she's got that beautiful doll's house to play with, but instead she's building a hospital for bugs out of toilet rolls and yogurt pots. You can take it with us to my mum's. Oh, I wish she was in a happy Mother's Day for me. I would do. And I was thinking about your mum this morning. Oh, thanks, Chris. She was very fond of you. Are you sure you're okay? Yeah. There is something, but can we talk about it tomorrow? What is it? I didn't want to say. Not this weekend, with Martha's birthday and Mother's Day. But you can't admit something's wrong and then expect me to leave it. Look, let's talk tomorrow. Well, I, I thought things were good between us. We're doing really well, are we? Are we? Uh, yes. What's this about, Chris? 
about Harry. I know about it. Whoops. What do you know? I just want to do some measuring up before we pack away. But only the state customers are already arrived. Don't be quiet, I promise. Tony, we've sold this as an indulgent escape. It, it doesn't look good having tools around and George up the ladder. Uh, yeah, you're, you're right. Well, we'll just grab our stuff and get out of your way. George, pack up the toolbox for me, would you? No problem. Afternoon, Kate. Afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> Happy Mother and Sunday. Thank you. Had a really nice morning. Phoebe rang while I was still in bed, and then I spoke to Mama Tandy and Zipo while Dad made me breakfast. Oh, sounds lovely. Good job we booked. Packed. <laughs> yeah, we've been turning people away. Um, I put you and Alice over there. What is that monstrosity? Oh, I assume you're talking about Tony's cow hide. It's hideous. Is it real? I'm afraid so. Oh. I can't be expected to eat a vegan afternoon tea under the flayed pelt of a once sentient creature. I agree with Kate, I'll move you. Um, Jill and Elizabeth can have your table, you take this one. Thank you. Can I get you a tea or a coffee? Um, a jasmine tea. Sorry for the disruption. George will finish me up and I'll be out of the area. Okay, thanks. I know you weren't keen on the idea of a Hines fan, but now we've got that one up. I have to admit, it does look rather good. It's bad enough you eat the animal, never mind humiliating it, displaying it like a hunting trophy. Kate, I know, I know you're not a meat eater, but I'm sure you prefer we're open about the journey of the food we serve. We're a farm tea room. Let's embrace the story of that. Hmm, good idea. Why not cover the walls in images of the slaughterhouse, then? Uh, a jasmine tea, wasn't it? Coming right up. All right, Violet. That's all done. You can eat a slice of cake on that floor now. Thanks, George, you're a star. I need somewhere to put this hide until Tuesday. <sighs> I don't care where it goes, as long as it is nowhere near the kitchen. Guessing you're not a fan. It doesn't matter what I think, I just hope more customers aren't cut off. Oh, maybe Tom and Natasha want people to make a fuss. Get them talking, like this will be their USP. You know what a USP is? Yes, of course I do. I've been on all the business courses. You know how to jump through the hoops for rural grants, smart targets, KPIs, all that jargon. Well, all I can say is they must be making a mint if they can throw 400 quid at a couple of cowboys. Is that what they cost? Yep, 200 pounds a pop. <laughs> oh well, it's not my money. Harrison should have told you that. I thought I knew. Anyway, don't have a go at Harrison. From what I've heard, he's really stuck his neck out for no, me. I wasn't having a go at him. He's been brilliant. I just... I wish you'd have said something at the time. And that's what you're going to focus on. Look, I, I was going to tell you, but it just didn't seem like the right moment. And, it, and it's embarrassing. But I knew there was something wrong with you. Well, I needed time to think about it. Silent fear. Look, I, I know it's a shock, but trust me, if anyone should be full of resentment that the man I thought might actually be nice was, was in fact a liar, then it should be me. And he's the only one, is he, that's a liar? I haven't met him. You lied about why you split up with him. Keep your voice down. Martha. You didn't think to mention he got arrested while driving a car and wasted. I didn't know he was a drinker. Oh, come on, Alice, you're an alcoholic. You must have known. A recovering alcoholic. And no, I didn't. You must have spotted the signs. Oh, well, you know us addicts. We're very good at hiding it. Yeah, you said it. I can't believe you're being like this. Did you drink together? Is that why you liked him? You've been drinking this whole time. No! Stop it! I'm sorry, Chuck. Is it? It's actually none of your business. Any of this is my mess. Why would you care? Because of Martha. And you. You're my wife. You. Not. you my ex. When Harrison told me, I thought I was going to be sick. Yeah, well, imagine how it felt for me. I liked Harry. I don't want to know. I don't want to hear anything about that man. Are you angry at me? Yes. No. I, not at you, but at this. It's Kate. She wants to know where I'm going. That's exactly what I wanted to avoid. I'd better go. I'll just say bye to Martha. Do you want to lift? No, thanks. Martha's bags on the bed. Let me step out. Oh, and don't worry. I promise I'll stick to tea. There's another.
and I've got a tea and cake. Oh, well, thank you. And uh, do you want us to start preparing your sandwiches and cakes, or is Alice... Oh, no, she's on her way. She's texted me her order. Oh, perfect. What are you having? I'll go for the vegan full afternoon tea. Uh, but can I have fruit scones with jam only, so no butter or cream? Oh, well, Emma will be disappointed. She's very proud of the stiffness of her whip on the flour-based cream. <laughs> <laughs> and for us? Uh, well, she like the full works, so meat, fish, cheese, whatever you're serving. Um, and large latte with dairy milk. Focusing on the cricket. Oh, that's great. But I can see he's struggling. Of course. You said Martha's birthday tea was nice. Yeah, we missed you there. Thanks for the doll's house. That was an incredible present. It was unbelievably generous of you. Oh, that was all Harrison. I didn't even know he was getting it. Oh. Anyway, I better get on. I've got your afternoon teas to make. Of course, yeah. Fallon. Yes. Interviewed yet? No, uh, they said it will be some time this week. Right. Good luck. Yeah, thanks. I had an informal interview yesterday. On Martha's birthday? Well, I must get it over with. Right. Well, uh, I need to get on. I'm really sorry about all this. Yeah, I know. I wish I could get Look, we just have to get on with it now. Hope for the best. And then I was thinking you were meant to be the punctual sister. Oh, sorry, Kate, I would explain why, but for once, I vote to be the sister as a neck and drama. <laughs> Don't be ridiculous. Sit down. Tell me everything. I'd rather talk about anything else, to be honest. Well, if you're sure, uh, would you rather hear about Jacob refusing to talk about whatever's happening at the vets, or how Sabrina Thwaite brought her dog for a massage at Spiritual Home on Friday? Oh. Or I could tell you exactly how many times Dad has complained about the weather and the replanting. Oh no, please not that. He's reacted to every conversation he's had with Scott. I love him to bits, but our mother must have been a saint to live in all those years. <laughs> so come on, tell me what happened. No, really, it's not. Is it Harry? No. Then yes. Chris found out about his arrest. He's really. Harry getting arrested in your fault. Why should it be this stupid? It's horrible. It's desperate to believe that something might work. Alice, stop. This has been awful for you, but you've got to blame. It's not what Chris thinks. I had a horrible row. I couldn't even do that properly because Mark was in the next room. Oh, forget Chris. This is the time to concentrate on your own journey. If you can. I can't forget Chris when I have to see him practically every day. It's hard enough when we're getting on. It's an atmosphere, everything's going to be so difficult. Look, you're right, you can't forget Chris. You obviously need to find a time to talk to him when Martha isn't around, but you also need to look after yourself. We need to find you a fun distraction. Look, I'm actually okay. What I really need to do is go over to the forge tomorrow and sort this out. Through the animals that call it home. We all want to protect this region. We are actually just the guests. They are the hosts. Tracking the planet on Radio 4 and BBC Sounds begins this Thursday afternoon at 4. We've got another short story from Trinidad for you in the Chronicles of Burke Street in half an hour. Now on Radio 4, our murder mystery drama Sabine continues. 
Ellie has found a USB drive of secret recordings Sabine made before she died. Sabine by Mark Healy. Episode 4. Hey Els, how you been? Miss me yet? So, you found the USB stick. Congratulations. Oh, it's so weird talking to you like this. What is it, Friday 23rd of Feb? And I only spoke to you this afternoon, but I miss you, sis. There's just so much I can't say on the phone. Then again, if you're watching this, you must have come down here to the flat pretty weird, right? And if I'm not here, there, I must be in some sort of trouble, maybe even locked away at His Majesty's pleasure. And you must be wondering what the hell's been going on. <sighs> okay, <clears throat> so to explain, on this extremely precious drive, there's a lot of videos, documents, data files. Basically, it's everything I've been working on these past few months. Now, I, I know I haven't told you or Ma about flunking out of uni, but you have to trust me. What I'm doing now is far more important. Basically, I've been working with an activist group against the multinational oil and gas company Invercore. They've got their claws sunk deep into governments all over the world. Main headline, we've got a big operation against them coming up. It's all pretty scary, and so I wanted to like document it here for you. Else, I don't need to tell you, you are the most important person in my life. I know I've been kind of weird and not very communicative recently, and for that I am truly, ah, no apologies, right? Not 